Hey guys, Kim here, and you are tuned back into Kim E, the Diabetes MP. So let's get right into it. I have started this new series for January where I'm giving my commentary over the newly released 2023 ADA standards of care. I've already done standard one, two, and today we are going to do standard three which is prevention or delay of type 2 diabetes and associated comorbidities. So here's that. And I will also link um, the PDF um, in the description box so you can read it, download it, whatever's your pleasure. But let's go ahead and get right into this one. It is not a very, it's not nearly as long as the first two. Um, I know longer ones are coming down the pipe, but um, this one was, was not a long one, okay? And so out the gate, it's talking, it's telling us that we should monitor for the development of type 2 diabetes in those with prediabetes at least annually, modify based on individual risk and benefit assessment. And so there's this big push for us Um to really do early screening detection, really realizing what people's risks are. There are some guide. There are some. There's guidance in the previous um, video um, with that um, standard. Um, who should be screened? When should they be screened? Um, we also know now that we are starting to screen everyone at age 35, which is a very young age. So that should tell you where the state of everything is. Okay, and so. Um, down here, it says the utility of A1C screening for prediabetes and diabetes may be limited in the presence of hemoglob hemoglobinopathies in, in conditions that affect the red blood cell turnover. Keep this in mind when you're dealing with certain conditions, things like pregnancy, people who are on hemodialysis, um, people who get, uh, who's lost a lot of blood getting blood transfusions, people who have HIV, um, A1C is not going to be reliable. And so you would lean into your OGTT. Okay. Not as convenient, but it does the job. Okay. Let's see what we got here. So we get into lifestyle behavior changes for diabetes prevention. This is my thing. I am big on prevention. I feel like we um, don't talk enough about prevention. I think also too, people, a lot of our, our system is structured where a lot of resources don't start until you have the diagnosis. And there's so much that we can do prior to that. And so, but this gives some guidance here. And so basically we go into this, um, this first section and they're explaining one of the trials, one of the, um, what do they call it? Oh, I can't remember the word. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not legacy trial, landmark, landmark trial. So I couldn't think of the word. I couldn't think of the word. But there was a whole study, the Diabetes Prevention Program, that went over um, the strongest evidence for this was that for diabetes prevention in the U.S. comes with the DPP. It demonstrated that intensive lifestyle interventions can, could reduce the risk of incident type uh, of the incident of type two by 58% over three years. Now there were two major goals with this study, and that uh, of the it was intensive lifestyle interventions. So and they were to achieve and maintain a minimum of seven percent weight loss. OK, and wait a minute, I'm not reading this right. I'm sorry. It says the two major goals of the DPP intensive lifestyle intervention were to achieve and maintain a minimum of 7 percent weight loss and 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, such as a breast walk. Sorry about that. So that was the big thing here is that it was big on lifestyle. OK, and they got great results, really great results, which then allowed them to develop the diabetes uh, prevention program that the CDC has that it was based that program is based off of this study. And so 
To implement the weight loss and physical activity goals, the DPP used an individual model of treatment rather than a group-based approach. See how we're going back to this individualization of care? Okay, the individual approach also allowed for the tailoring of interventions to reflect the diversity of the population. So here's the thing. When we're talking about lifestyle modifications and behavior changes and things like that, you must understand that everybody's different. There is no one size fits all. Okay. And so with that, some people have the capacity to do different types of uh, exercises and activities. Well, some people don't, but that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. And that's why having this individualized approach is, is the thing. So, and if y'all hear some little voices, my kids are arguing and I can hear my husband out there trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to referee out there. But if you hear that, that's my little five-year-older that has gotten herself worked up for some reason or another. So do excuse me there. Um, after the DPP, we talk about the nutrition counseling. And this is what I will have to say about nutrition. It is probably the most underutilized uh, discipline to refer somebody to a dietitian, a nutrition, a nutritionist, a uh, dietitian. I find that really a lot of people don't really even know that that's an option for them. Patients don't. And then I also find that um, I also find that many people's never gone, and a lot of people don't refer. A lot of providers who don't prefer. I mean, refer. And the thing about nutrition as well, I often I often get the question. I often get the question, what's the best meal for the best diet for diabetes? And for one, we really don't like to use that language of diet because that doesn't evoke like lifestyle. That's like something I do to get a certain goal and that's it. And so hold on one minute, y'all. I. So sorry about that. I had to mute my mic because there was some things that were um, going on out there. And I, it was a lot of emotion with my children. So I'm sorry. It's real life, y'all. This is how it really is in real life. So sorry about that. Um, but uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Yeah, so I was talking about diet. We actually like to use the, the wording eating pattern because how do you typically eat? What's the pattern of how you eat? And what I like to tell people is that what I like to tell people is that like there is no one size fits all. Everyone can ascribe to the same type of diet. And that's where, where a dietitian can really help you because they really do take in your preferences, what you like, what you can eat, because there are restrictions. People have allergies, food allergies and stuff. So, I mean, to say that one one like type of eating pattern would fit everyone in our population like that that just wouldn't work okay even if we all wanted it to work so it talks a little bit about that um physical activity so the recommendation here this hasn't changed 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical acti activity and the thing about physical activity is that it allows our muscles to be more sensitive to insulin and increases insulin sensitivity. And so I often tell people when I when people hear that 150, they're like, what? But I'm like, that's over a week though. So you really honestly could do 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and you'll get it in. You know what I'm saying? Or you can get more in. But if you look at it like that, or like I go and you know, do an hour or whatever, if you were to do 
three times a week, 60 minutes, you got it. You know, like you've gotten more, you know? And so you really have to think about, you really have to think about, you know, that. And when I break it down for people, they tend to really, that seems way more doable, right? So that was that. Um, Let's see here. Talked about the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which was based off the DPP um, study. And so if you are interested in that, so that comes um, with, and I, I may I may leave that if I can remember to do it, but the CDC has the Di National Diabetes Prevention Program, and this is for people who are not already diagnosed with diabetes, but they're at risk. And there are some criteria um, for that. The ADA and the, and the uh, ADCES, which are the Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, they actually have a diabetes program, a diabetes self-management education uh, program that is accredited through, you can, you can have a program set up through them and accredited and recognized through them. And so those are some options that you can put people to uh, through if they already have the diagnosis. But the next section kind of goes into what that is and the toolkit and coverage and how to set that up. And then we get into um, prevention of vascular disease and mortality. I think we should talk about that a little bit. So it's already, we already talked in the previous, I think it was the previous standard that People with prediabetes have that, we should look at that as an opportunity to start screening for cardiovascular um, risk factors. They often have the risk, other risk factors such as hypertension and dyslipidemia and are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So like, again, look at this as a golden opportunity to kind of double down and who to screen. And if you can't identify this, it's like they're already putting that out there for you to let you know. These are people who have increased risk there. Um, I think that's it for all I wanted to say for that one. The next thing, the last thing actually is patient-centered care goals. And I always talk about this. I'm going to talk about this until I'm like blue in the face. I know I know, y'all probably are getting tired of me talking about individualization of care, patient-centered, person-centered, whole person care. But here's the thing, we're not doing it. That's why I'm going to keep talking about it because people are literally like, well, what am I supposed to do? What does the guideline say I'm supposed to do? Well, the guidelines is full of us. We need to be very patient-centered with everything that we're going to do because this is how we're going to get our outcomes. Um, we have to consider the patient. The patient needs to have an active role in everything that we're going to do if we're looking to get out good outcomes. And that's just simply put. So in this section, it talks, it says it's important to individualize the risk and benefit, benefit of intervention and consider the person as a whole. OK, um, so that's, you know, they talk about that. They talk about even when we go about choosing what kind of pharma, uh, pharmacology, our medications, you got to keep the per per uh, person in mind. You got to get the keep the person at the center of your care. And I think that one was it. We're in under 15 minutes. Again, I do apologize for my break, but this one was a short one. So I wanted to get this one in right quick. Um, Again, I appreciate you guys coming back. Um, let me know what y'all are thinking about this. Are you liking this series? Is there anything that you, you all would like for me to incorporate more? What my goal is, is to not sit and just like hit every single section. I'm just really like basically the things that I have highlighted that were interested, interesting to me when I was reading through it. Kind of want to talk about that a little bit tell y'all some things that you may may not know and um, just let this be a good enjoyable educational session. So anyways, let me know what you think. Drop down in the comments and let me know how you guys are liking this so far. Um, you have been sitting here with Kim E, the Diabetes MP. If you're not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, 
I would love to have you over there. I have already well over 100 videos that I, I've been making for some years now already there. And so you can go over there, hang out, um, make sure you subscribe, but also ding the notification bell. So when I do go live like this, when I do post a new video, you'll know that I'm here. You know, that you'll know to come on over and hang out. Um, also, follow me on all things social. You can, follow, you can find me on Instagram at the Diabetes MP. Um, you can follow me. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever there is a place to be found, I am there. And so anyways, guys, I'm going to go ahead and hop on off. Um, I'll catch y'all tomorrow. Same time, same place. Again, you've been sitting here with Kimmy, the Diabetes MP. I'll catch y'all the next one. Bye.